Welcome, everyone. My name is Brendan Hassett. I'm a professor of mathematics at Brown and also the director of ISERM. ISERM is the Institute for Computational Experimental Research in Mathematics. We are an NSF-funded, National Science Foundation-supported institute devoted to promoting positive interactions between mathematics and computation. So we're interested in uh, algorithms being a product of mathematical research and also using computational experiments to try to understand deep mathematical ideas that you can't just glean through pen and paper computation. And so we hold many short and long-term programs to support research at the interface of math and computation. And so tonight's lecture is, is I think, a really great example of how different perspectives on research can, can, um, can have, a, have important benefits. Um, I like to say that as a director of a math institute, a lot of my job is social engineering, and I think you know, this project with Folded is a wonderful example of, of social engineering. Uh, so Faris Kitab is an is a assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth in the Computer and Information Sciences Department. So he did his doctorate <coughs> at UC Santa Cruz and did postdoctoral work at the University of Washington. So he's done very serious research on the topic of his lecture. So he has a paper in Nature, which is one of the most famous uh, scientific research journals, on <coughs> predicting protein structures with a multiplayer online game that's folded. It received a thousand citations. So what you're seeing tonight is very serious science with important applications. And I think it's really emblematic of how if you have a really nice idea, it can bring lots of people into the scientific research process. And I, I personally find that quite inspirational to, to have so many people involved and in doing original work. Um, so this work has been pro, uh, profiled in a lot of places outside nature and the proceedings of the National Academy. He's been on All Things Considered, which uh, you know, is really cool. Um, he's been on NBC News, Fox News. So, so this is something that has also resonated, not with the scientific community, but with popular culture at large. And so we're really lucky to have uh, Professor Khatib here tonight. He's going to talk about Foldit and how it can be used to solve puzzles for science. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction uh, and for uh, inviting me here. Um, so I actually was an applied uh, math major uh, in college, but I really wasn't sure what I was going to do next uh, until my senior year uh, when I took a class called the Mathematics of the Human Genome Project. And immediately it just clicked for me. I was like, wow, I could apply my math to this. This, this, is, this is amazing. And I was certain when I got to grad school, I would continue and study genomics. The human genome had just been solved, and uh, UC Santa Cruz had been a very big part of that. But the first graduate I took, first graduate class I took uh, at UC Santa Cruz, happened to be about the protein folding problem. And ever since that class, I have been hooked on properly folding proteins. And I want to explain why by first looking at how small proteins are. So to get a proper sense of scale, we're going to be zooming in and we see a sesame seed, and then we see a grain of salt, and an amoeba, and we zoom in more, and we start seeing a skin cell, and we start seeing a red blood cell, and we start to see E. coli, and then we start to see some proteins because we start to see viruses such as measles and HIV, which are all made up of proteins and influenza and hepatitis. And, and then we start actually seeing uh, proteins such as hemoglobin. And if we zoom in even further, we see the amino acids that make uh, proteins such as uh, methionine. And so hopefully you can see with this that proteins are so small, we can't see them with a microscope. And in fact, if we look at an artist rendering of the Zika virus in red uh, at the very top with the cross section shown uh, on the left, there are many different proteins that make up uh, Zika. They're envelope proteins. Those are the, the red ones that we see. They're membrane proteins in magenta. They're capsid proteins that are inside uh, the virus. Those are the orange ones. And if we look at HIV, for example, HIV is made up of 15 different viral proteins. And that's in addition to the proteins that it took from the last cell uh, that it infected. Now again, this is an artist's rendering of HIV. 
But on the right, we can see what HIV actually looks like, thanks to this CDC image from an electron microscope, where you can see all the different copies of HIV in green. And although it's really amazing to be able to see this uh, with an electron microscope, the resolution is nowhere near as good as the drawing on the left. This starts to give us a pretty good idea of how small proteins are. But what makes proteins special in the first place? How come proteins get their own video game, right? Well, proteins don't just make up nasty viruses. They are molecules that carry out many different functions that are fundamental to life. And so when you look at this small subset uh, of proteins that I'm showing you here, you can notice that they all look very different from one another. And the reason for this is that the structure of a protein determines its function. So the way a protein folds determines what that protein will do in your body. So for example, if we look at insulin here, insulin has a very different shape than hemoglobin because insulin and hemoglobin perform very different tasks in your body. So if we want to understand how a protein works, we need to find out its structure, what shape the protein actually folds up as. So we need to know the shape if we want to understand its function, but it turns out that the shape of a protein, the structure that a protein folds up into, is completely determined by its protein sequence. We get the sequence from the original DNA sequence, which then goes to RNA, which then goes to the protein sequence. And so each unique protein sequence folds up into a unique protein structure. So this sequence, which is different than the previous one, will fold up into a very different looking uh, protein, and, and this one as well. And so each of these uh, protein sequences will fold into a unique structure, and we call this the native protein structure, the native fold of that protein, the one with the lowest free energy. So we need to know the native structure of this protein if we want to understand exactly how it works, but this is actually very, very hard to do. There are experimental methods for solving protein structures, but they are very, very time consuming. Some of them take years to solve a single uh, structure. They're also very, very expensive. And unfortunately, sometimes they don't work. In fact, the gap between the number of known protein sequences, so the sequences that uh, we get from all the genomes that have been solved, we have all this information for our protein sequences, but the number of protein structures that have been solved is much, much more uh, difficult. So we have much fewer uh, protein structures that have been solved compared to the protein uh, sequences. So all the genomes are being solved. We have actually no uh, idea what most of the corresponding protein structures actually look like. So this is what drew me to the field of protein structure prediction, trying to use computers to bridge this gap. So the Rosetta algorithm was developed at the University of Washington to predict how a protein folds up given just its amino acid sequence. Rosetta basically cheats by trying to use as many bits of known solved proteins that, as it can. So right now, as it's folding, you can see it's trying lots of different conformation and it's trying to fit in lots of different pieces, it's getting those pieces from proteins that have already been solved. And it's trying them all out and trying to see which one fits best. And when it's done, then hopefully it gets very close to the correct uh, native topology, the native fold of the protein, which is shown here uh, in white. You can imagine these calculations are going to be run on computers and it's going to require a lot of computational power. But even using clusters of supercomputers isn't enough to solve this problem. We actually needed more computational power than that. So we turn to distributed computing, where people donate their free CPU cycles from their computers to actually try to solve uh, different problems. There are many different distributed computing projects. Uh, when I was an undergrad, the very famous one at the time was the SETI at home project, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and everybody would donate their computers when we went off to class, because we didn't have laptops, 
This was a while ago. Uh, and, and then they would run all these Fourier transforms to try to see if the radio signals actually uh, corresponded to any extraterrestrial life. But there's many other uh, distributed computing pro pro programs. In fact, Folding at Home is another protein folding uh, distributed computing uh, project from uh, Stanford. And the Rosetta algorithm has its own distributed uh, computing project, uh, which comes with a lovely Rosetta at Home screensaver. There are 1.3 million users of Rosetta at Home, but even all that computational strength just is not enough. The problem is that proteins have so many different possible confir confirmations that they can fold into. There's so many different ways that they can fold that you could take all the supercomputers on Earth and you wouldn't be able to sample the ways a single protein can fold. There's too many possibilities. Why is that? Well, this right here is a very, very tiny subset of a protein. This is, in fact, only two amino acids. Proteins have thousands of these. And you can see already all the different degrees of freedom that we're dealing with here. So proteins have too many degrees of freedom. And to make it even worse, the energy landscape becomes more rugged as your energy function becomes more realistic. So the better energy function you come up with, the more easily you'll be trapped in local minima. So you could be very, very close uh, to the native, and you wouldn't even know it because your energy function would, would, would ha have you trapped uh, in, in a local minimum. So what would be great is if we can somehow guide these computations in you know, an intelligent way. Well, a very funny thing happened with Rosetta at Home is that a lot of the users who were donating their, their CPU time for Rosetta at Home started staring at the screensaver like you have for the past couple minutes. And then they started contacting us. And they said, your algorithm is making some very silly mistakes. You need to move the helix to the right when instead it's moving it to the left. What you really should do is let us intervene. And so that's actually how Foldit got started. Foldit is a graphical user interface representation of Rosetta where proteins can be manipulated with the Rosetta energy shown in real time here at the top. So you can pull on the protein. You can perform gradient-based minimization on the protein, which in the game we call wiggle. You can perform combinatorial sidechain rotomer packing, which we call shake. You can add constraints, which are these rubber bands here. You can freeze parts of the protein. You can perform more uh, complicated tasks. Folded is also a multiplayer online video game where players compete to fold proteins and try to get the best score. Now, that was the first lesson we learned is Gamers do not like to optimize for low energies and negative uh, free energy, so the higher score is better. And, uh, and that, was, that was one of the things that we had to make sure that you're trying to get a high score in the game. So folded players can also form teams to share their strategies uh, and uh, their solutions. So who's playing folded? Well, it might not be surprising that most folded players are men uh, and that many of them are students. Uh, but one, 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 one aspect that uh, I think is really cool is that 50% of our students, 50% uh, of our uh, players are from the US uh, or the UK, but the other half are from all over the world. Uh, and in fact, uh, our folded players have translated the game into various languages so that uh, everybody can play it, um, you know, no matter where uh, they are. But we wanted to know who was really playing folded. Was it a bunch of protein experts who study proteins all day? Uh, all day long and then go home and then play a protein folding video game? We, we didn't think so, but we asked our very top folded players, okay, how much prior biochemistry knowledge do you have? And the majority of them said, well, you know, I haven't taken you know, chemistry since high school or I have no experience whatsoever. Uh, and and that's, that's very exciting because suddenly you're getting a completely different angle on the problem that many experts have been trying to solve uh, and, and have you know, had, had a, a lot of trouble with. But because of this, because um, this game is actually designed for non-experts and does not require reading an entire biochemistry textbook before playing the game, uh, there are some things that we had to add, certain visualizations to highlight some of the fundamental rules of well-folded proteins. So you may not know 
uh, much about protein folding, but you know that in a video game, a big red spiky ball is a bad thing, right? <laughs> Gotta get rid of that. And so that represents a clash, uh, where the proteins uh, are too close and the atoms are overlapping. Get rid of the big spiky red ball. Big red voids are also bad. Proteins like to be well folded. They do not like to have cavities uh, inside them. Uh, and so you want to try to eliminate as many uh, voids as possible. Again, these are red. Uh, we want to hide oily hydrophobics, which are represented by these little yellow greasy balls here. And these are side chains that want to be hidden in the interior of the protein, uh, but they're not as bad as clashes or voids, so we paint them yellow. And then proteins love having hydrogen bonds, so we show these with these uh, blue and, uh, and white lines, and you try to get as many of those as possible. Uh, while obviously getting rid of as many of the red things as you can. So in order to teach people not you know, all the biochemistry that you need to know in order to fold proteins, but more all the tools that you need to understand to become an expert folded player and be able to contribute uh, to uh, the game, we have these uh, training levels, uh, which are uh, basically tutorials to teach you you know, what, what you need to know in order to, to be able to be successful in the game. So when you play um, one of the training levels, it tells you, ah, here's a little tooltip that nobody ever reads. Nobody likes reading hints uh, at all. And then you try to solve uh, the puzzle, and your score uh, will go up here. And if you pass a certain, certain threshold, then you get the fireworks, and there'd be music, and everybody would be very happy, and then you move on to the, to the next level. So the first thing we wanted to test with Foldit was to make sure are the tools that we've given the players in the game actually sufficient to get to the right answer? Can they get to that native fold of a protein with you know, the, the powers that we've given to, um, to them uh, in the game? So we gave them just an amino acid sequence uh, in an extended form. So this is just a, a protein chain that's just completely extended with uh, different amino acids on it. And then in the background as a ghost, we gave them the answer, the native. And we said, here's, here's what you can manipulate, this long piece of string. Can you fold it into this shape that they could clearly see uh, on the screen? And you can see that the native correct structure here is in blue, and the top scoring folded solution is in uh, pink. And they got spot on. This is as good as you can ever hope. And this is an RMSD plot. I'm going to be showing you um, a bunch of these, so I want to make sure um, that they're, they're very clear. Each green dot on these plots represents a different folded player's solution. And the further you are to the left, the closer to zero. A point is the closer that player's prediction is to the native correct structure. So if you had a uh, RMSD of zero, that would be a perfect match uh, to the native. It'd be you know spot on. And you can see they got very, very close. Um, to uh, the, the correct fold here that we see in blue. But remember, when you're, when you're um, playing this game, you don't know what the answer is. So you don't actually know how close you are to the, to the native. The only thing that you know is your score, the folded score, which is a uh, positive version of the energy. So you're trying to get as negative you ca as you can uh, on, on this plot. And that's the only thing that you have uh, that's driving you, the only thing that you can see. But for this test case, it was really nice to see, OK, all these folded solutions were kind of uh, earlier in the puzzle, and as people got better and better energies and better folded scores, they got closer and closer to the native. So this was excited, exciting. OK, you know, the tools we provided to the players are sufficient to reach uh, the native state. So the protein structure prediction problem, again, is given an amino acid sequence, what structure does it fold into? What does the native fold look like? We wanted to know, well, how well do our folded players compare to automated methods, uh, automated computational methods. But it became uh, quickly apparent to us that to test this, we would need some blind cases. What do I mean by that? Well, blind cases where the native solve structure was actually not publicly available. And why is that? Well, we would previously take a solve protein, and then we would kind of just mess it up, and then unfold it, kind of like this, and give it to the players and say, hey, try to fold it. And they would return the protein, and it would look exactly like the correct native structure. And we would be so excited. We've solved protein folding. This is great. But it turns out our players are just very, very clever. 
And they found a thing called the Protein Data Bank online, where you can see all the proteins that have been solved already, and they could match it up and go, oh, this fold like that. And so, so that's why we need uh, proteins that are about to be experimentally solved, um, blind structures that no one uh, could use. And so uh, actually from now on, uh, everything that I'll show you will come from puzzles where the native, uh, the native solution was unknown to the players, uh, and so there could be no shenanigans or anything like that. So we had uh, this, these 10 uh, blind cases, and uh, we wanted to run a comparison against the Rosetta algorithm given the exact same uh, starting model. So we looked at the best scoring models that were, that were produced. We didn't look at the ones that were closest to the native because, again, all we know is our energy function and our score. And we compared uh, how far those models were to the correct uh, native structure. So again, the lower the number, the better. If there was a, a zero there, that would be a perfect match uh, to the native. And so you can see for five of these cases here, uh, the folded players uh, were closer than Rosetta's automated method. Uh, for three of these cases, they were about, about the same. And for two of these cases, uh, the folded players did worse than Rosetta. Um, but even Rosetta didn't, didn't do very well on that. Um, so these are uh, difficult proteins for, for everybody. Um, but I want to focus on uh, the case where folded players were able to significantly uh, outperform Rosetta because it really highlights one of the advantages that humans have over uh, computers. And so we're going to look at how one player took that incorrectly exposed blue tail of the protein. So this, this tail of the protein shouldn't be sticking out like that. In the native, it's actually buried in the protein. And we're just going to look at what that player did uh, over time and see how their score changed. So the first thing this player did is they took that uh, blue tail and they kind of unraveled the protein, which gave them a worse score than what they had started with. And then they did something interesting by completely unraveling the protein and getting a horrendous score. Now, you're not protein ex experts, but you know that no proteins look like that. As I said before, proteins like to be nice and, and compact and well-folded, and that, not a chance. And so their score was horrible. Why did they do this? Well, this was the necessary step that they had to do in order to then be able to bring that blue tail into the core of the protein, getting them a better score, still not as good as what they had started with, but then eventually having it fit nicely in the protein, getting it very close to what the actual native structure looks like, and, uh, and ending up with a better energy than they had started with. And so if we look at uh, this on one of those RMSD plots, where again, every dot on the plot represents a different folded player, uh, a different folded solution. And now if we uh, follow the trajectory of that player that we just looked at, uh, which is highlighted in blue, starting from uh, the starting model, which is this black dot here, we can see that the player started unraveling the protein, going in the complete wrong direction from where the correct answer is, with really, really, really horrible, uh, horrible scores uh, and energies. But then they were able to then get closer, and that's what they uh, needed to do in order to get very, very uh, close to the correct native structure, especially compared to the starting uh, model. This is the advantage that humans have over computers. If we compare this to the Rosetta algorithm, the automated uh, protocol, which is in yellow here, the best Rosetta ever did, the furthest to the left that it got, was this model up here. But it didn't keep going. Why not? Well, that model has a pretty bad score. All these other models over here have much better scores. So the algorithm said, well, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to go back to those. I'm going to keep going over here. And in fact, the best scoring uh, Rosetta model was further from the native than the starting structure. But that's the advantage that humans have uh, over computers, being able to, to, to have the foresight to say, you know what, I'm going to have to do some crazy, horrible moves that are going to give me horrible scores, that are going to do, you know, make horrible things to the protein in order to get to the right answer. But as computer scientists, we could just tell our computers to do that. Why don't you just keep going? If you get to this point, even if your score is bad, keep going. That would be very easy to encode, right? But then we'd have to do the same thing for that dot, and that dot, and that dot, and all of them. We'd have to say, keep going no matter what, right? And as we saw, that's just too much uh, computational complexity, right? 
So you can see uh, how close the green uh, folder prediction is to the native uh, in blue. So this is the, the, the uh, folded solution in, uh, in green. That was the top scoring one and uh, the native structure in blue. And if you compare that to the red model uh, that started and went uh, this way instead of um, starting uh, over there, it was, it was a pretty um, dramatic uh, switch in, uh, in the topology of, uh, of the protein. So one other advantage that humans have over the computers is the ability to actually try different methods. Our automated Rosetta protocol basically does these different tasks in the first hour, in the first day, and over the length of its entire job. You know, it's very, very methodical, does this, then that, then that, then that. Our folded players, these are four different folded players uh, on two different types of puzzles. They do all sorts of different things depending on uh, the puzzle type or depending on, you know, when, when they're running it. For example, this player here does this purple move in the first hour for refinement puzzles, but they definitely barely do it at all for freestyle puzzles. Very, very different as opposed to our automated protocol, which does the same thing uh, no matter what the case is. So we're interested in learning, well, how exactly are the folded players able to solve these problems? One possible route we could have gone would have been to turn to machine learning, where we would analyze the wealth of data that's provided by the players and try to figure out which are the more successful methods. But it turns out the players actually provided this information uh, to us themselves. They created their own wiki, the Foldit wiki, and then they started posting their own strategies. You know, for refinement pro puzzles, I do this and this and this and this. And then for uh, freestyle puzzles, I do this and this and this. And, you know, it was, it, was, it was really cool. And we said, okay, let's just allow them to encode their own algorithms. And so we provided um, uh, what's called a cookbook where they could um, create recipes. Uh, and these recipes were based on a different ingredients. Uh, and these all have fun sounding names because that's what games are. Uh, and, and so then, you know, not only did the players like this because if, imagine if you're doing the exact same tasks over and over and over again, you're going to get, you know, carpal tunnel syndrome for one thing, uh, but then it would be very dull. Now they could actually encode their algorithm and say, you know, if I want to do this and this and this, you know, I can run that and I can also share it with my uh, folded teammates and then they can actually modify uh, my recipes and, 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 and change, things, change things. And so initially we gave them this block based version here uh, and then you would run your recipe uh, and it would go through the, uh, I'll, I'll execute all the, the list of commands. And the players love this, but then they quickly said, you know, we want more power. We want a scripting language where we can, you know, have for loops and conditionals and all this stuff. Uh, and so we, we provided one of those uh, using the Lua uh, scripting language, which is um, the one used in World of Warcraft. Um, so when we looked at what were the most used recipes, we were very surprised to see uh, two outliers. So first of all, uh, each color represents a different folded player. So this folded player here uh, in pink wrote this recipe and they didn't share it with anybody, they just used it a lot. Uh, this folded player here uh, wrote this recipe and probably shared it with their teammates because there's only a few people that used it. Um, but a lot of these and most of these were, were shared publicly with all the other folded players, which is really cool if you think about it because these are different folded teams that are in competition with one another and yet they're sharing each other's methods. Um, but there were these you know, very obvious two uh, outliers that were used way more than all the other recipes. Uh, and Quake is actually a recipe written in that block-based cookbook that I just showed you. Um, and Blue Fuse, the one that was used the most there, is a very similar recipe that was written in that Lua scripting language. Uh, and this is the entire algorithm uh, right here. And don't worry about trying to figure out what any of that stuff means. Um, I've, I've basically shown uh, here on the right uh, kind of basically uh, what it's doing. And it's a very, very... Uh, cool technique where it basically lowers the, repulses, the repulsive force uh, in the game. So it allows you to make clashes as opposed to usually the clashes would be really bad. And then it does some minimization and then brings back that repulsion force to the, the regular setting that it is. And then it lowers it uh, again and does some more minimization and then uh, increases it again. And it, and it does this uh, uh, a few times. The reason this is uh, really cool is at the same time, uh, in uh, the Rosetta lab, multiple postdocs were working on a very similar algorithm that pretty much does exactly the same thing. 
It lowers the repulsive force, does the minimization as it increases it, and then lowers it again, and does this five to 15 times, depending on, uh, on what settings you, you put. And so this was called uh, the fast relax algorithm. And so we obviously wanted to compare, well, how do the, how do the algorithms uh, c compare? Um, and so we r ran this on a, um, on a test set of, of Rosetta models, as well as um, native proteins. And so what this show, plot shows is the performance of the previously published uh, Rosetta algorithm, which was called classic relax. And the classic relax uh, algorithm is able to sample lower energies the longer it's run, which is what you would want. The problem is when you're running this on hundred and hundreds of thousands of predictions, uh, it's not efficient to run classic relax for that long uh, on every single model, which is why the lab was searching for a faster algorithm. So the fast relax algorithm is what they came up with to replace it. And you can see it's much more efficient uh, than classic relax. It gets to much lower energies much faster. Uh, and then you can see that the folded algorithm blue fuse here is somewhere in between. I thought this was still pretty impressive that the players had come up with something that was better than a previously published method, uh, classic relax, even though they didn't outperform the latest algorithm. But after submitting the paper, a reviewer actually pointed out, this is not a fair comparison because the tools that we're giving the folded players are actually diluted versions of the Rosetta algorithm. Rosetta algorithm is designed to run on supercomputers, so it's you know, much, much more efficient than running on people's laptops. So we give them you know, a, a diluted version of, of, of what Rosetta has. So they said a more fair comparison would be to rewrite this fast relax algorithm in the folded language, right? Let's say a folded player had actually come up with the exact fast relax algorithm and written it in uh, a Lua script, what would that look like? And so, again, the longer you run fast relax, even with uh, this version, the lower energies uh, you will get, and, and they'll, you know, they'll be better than Blue Fuse. But it actually turns out that Folded Player's average runtime for Blue Fuse was just 120 seconds. So, given the tools available in Foldit and the CPU times that were most compatible with their gameplay, the players actually discovered an algorithm that's superior to the one that postdocs had come up with in the lab. Multiple postdocs that are paid a lot of money, <laughs> but not enough, not enough money. Um, <laughs> and what I like the most about this is not only did the players discover this algorithm in a few months, they immediately all converged on it. Uh, every, uh, you know, all the players that you know, work on the team of the player who created it. Everybody used, used Blue Fuse. It, was, it became even uh, in the folded lingo, like, oh yeah, I fused that protein. It was, everybody was using it. So this was really exciting, but what we really wanted to do was to apply fold it to a real world problem. And the Mason Pfizer monkey virus retroviral protease is a protein that causes simian AIDS in rhesus monkeys. And for the longest time, experimentalists had worked on trying to solve the structure of this protein uh, and they had been unable to do it. The crystallographers couldn't come up with a model that was good enough to fit the data. So um, this is a real simple version of, of crystallography, but basically if you get a, get a model to fit the crystallographic data, then you can solve uh, the structure. And the conventional methods have, had failed, the state-of-the-art methods had failed, and they turned to the Rosetta lab and said, can you use your Rosetta at home uh, predictions? Um, to just, just come up with a model that, that's good enough to fit uh, our experimental data. And that didn't work. Turns out that there was a low resolution model uh, of this protein that was solved uh, by, uh, by NMR, and that wasn't good enough for molecular replacement. It wasn't good enough to fit the data. Uh, and so it was really kind of a last ditch, well, let's give it to the folded players. And so we gave them actually this is an NMR ensemble of 10 different models. We gave them all 10, and we said, can, can you make these better? And we gave them three weeks. We usually only give them a week for a puzzle, but you know, this was special. So this is uh, NMR model one, and this is uh, player SP Vincent's 2,771st model after working on it for five days. And already, SP Vincent has gotten closer to the correct native structure. You can see here the blue and the yellow uh, is a lot closer uh, than, uh, than the red. But if we look at it from a different angle, we can see that these core side chains here are you know, quite off. They, they, don't, they don't 
line up very well. But luckily, SP Vincent has a teammate uh, on his team named Grabhorn, who was able to improve on SP Vincent's model. And now we can see the core here looks really, really nice. But this loop in the top left is still quite wrong. Luckily, a third teammate, Mimi, all the way in England, was able to tuck that loop in. And in fact, this green model here is what crystallographers used to be able to solve the structure of this protein using molecular replacement. That green model fit the data well enough that they were actually able to solve the protein. And in fact, that's the only way that I'm able to show you this blue native structure because it was not known uh, in, until then. And if we compare that to the starting model, which was uh, in red here, we can see how much of a drastic difference it is between uh, Mimi's, Mimi's model here in green and, and the starting model uh, in, uh, in red. But I want to note that this was not uh, the top scoring model. But it doesn't matter because for molecular replacement, you just need one model to be good enough to fit the data. In fact, this plot highlights that just one model is good enough. After the fold folded model was used to solve the structure, we took all that team's predictions and superimposed them onto the native. And so for a model to be good enough to fit the experimental data, it has to be at least above this uh, light blue line uh, up here. And on the x-axis is time, where is, is, is the model number of the first um, 75,000 models uh, that were generated over the first 11 days of the puzzle. And in fact, this puzzle itself, after three weeks, generated a million structures. Um, but we just needed one. So the structure of HIV-1 retroviral protease um, was actually solved 25 years ago, but only in its dimeric form, where you have two copies that basically join up uh, with each other. Until this uh, folded player discovery, there was no crystal structure of a retroviral protease uh, solved in its monomeric form. And the hope is that somehow preventing this dimerization uh, will disrupt the activity, and then that mechanism uh, could be used to design better antiretroviral drugs. Our collaborators in Poland that had been uh, working on this for over 14 years were so excited uh, about this result that they made us open bottles of champagne over Skype. It was <laughs> such a big deal to them. Uh, but the interesting thing is when we asked those three players uh, if they wanted to be co-authors on the paper with us, they respectfully declined and said, no, we want our team, the contenders, to be co-authors. We fold as a team. It doesn't matter if only three of us touched you know, that particular model. Our, our recipes are all shared. Our strategies are all shared. Uh, and so we had to publish the paper with Fold It Contenders Group uh, as co-authors, uh, which I thought was very noble in, in academia. It's very rare. So, no, no, don't put me on the paper. Um, so when I, when I was showing these results uh, in, in class to my students, um, one student raised her hand and asked, so you sent the experimentalists the folded models, and those crystallographers tried to fit them in their electron density to see if it would fit, right? Well then, why don't you just give that electron density data to fold it in the first place? And I was just like, yes. <laughs> it was one of those uh, very happy moments. Um, because that's exactly uh, what the next step was, obviously, and what I wrote a lot of grants about. Um, and so, fold it in with, with electron density is, it, to me, it was just, just a no-brainer. Um, and I, I, I really thought, you know, if we simply provide this additional information to the players, it'll be sufficient for them to reach the native state because, you know, the conformational source space is so huge, you can't fold through everywhere. So if we tell you, ah, it's only here, that'll save them so much time. You know, they'll be folding only here and they won't be wasting time folding in, in other places. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> so um, we, we gave them models that were actually relatively close uh, to the native uh, and close to the density, but the players found models that 
scored a lot better that, as you can see, were nowhere near uh, the, the, the native structure. I mean, you know, none of these got anywhere um, close to what the correct um, structure was. Uh, so that was, you know, a speed bump. But then the breakthrough was when we actually rewarded p players for matching the density by putting that into the folded score. It, it turns out that incentivizing it in the score by rewarding the players for actually matching the density, not just telling them you should match the density, that, that was the difference. Um, so again, for all these, all these cases, these are, these are blind cases um, where, where the players didn't have um, the native. And suddenly, by rewarding them for matching the density, we got you know, exactly the type of plot that we hope, where the lower the energies are, the closer and closer it is uh, to the native. And so this, what I'm showing you here for this particular puzzle is just the Rosetta energy, but this is the exact same plot for the exact same puzzle with the Rosetta energy plus that bonus for matching the density. And so you can see here that really the lowest energy ones are super, super close uh, to the native and, and there'll be no kind of mistaking, oh, you know, should I pick this one or should I pick this one because their energies are, are kind of similar and they're very, very different models. Here, all the models are very close uh, to the native and that was um, very, very exciting. And you can see now, you know, how close that top scoring fold uh, solution is to the native. It's, you know, pretty much identical with very minor uh, differences uh, here. Uh, and it turns out that was really the crucial element um, that, that we had been missing, ensuring that the players are uh, incentivized for fitting uh, that experimental data. Suddenly, our players were fitting uh, even really ridiculously large uh, densities. I can't see anything in there, um, yet the folded players can, because they're amazing. Uh, and there are many automated methods that actually fit electron density, but they don't always work. And so this was exactly the type of case that we were looking for. Um, you know, we wanted to give the folded players something that the automated methods uh, hadn't been able to come up with uh, anything meaningful. Uh, this is the very best model that uh, AutoBuild uh, came up with, and, and this is the native structure. Not really useful, right? You, you, you really need the, the entire protein. Um, so this was a blind case that automated methods had failed on. And before we had had uh, access to the native, uh, or any electron density for that matter, uh, we gave the players five uh, different starting models that were generated uh, by the Rosetta server, which uses uh, Rosetta at home. And these were the five uh, models that we gave the players. There's two over here and then uh, these three. And you can see they were you know, barely able to improve on, uh, on these and they weren't able to get anywhere near uh, the native uh, structure. These plots were generated months later when the native was finally solved. We even gave them uh, a different puzzle for the same protein with five other starting models that were generated by a completely different prediction server that uses different methods that are very different with a different scoring function uh, than Rosetta or Foldit. Some of the Foldit players got a little bit closer uh, than before, but still you know, nowhere near uh, the native structure. This was exactly the type of uh, a problem that we're looking for. Automated methods couldn't solve it, and players couldn't get close to it. So it's time to add some experimental data and see if that helps. A few months after that previous puzzle, before the native structure was released, we were able to get electron density information and give it to the folded players. We posted this puzzle in two rounds. The first round shown here was with this huge electron density cloud and an extended chain. And even after just the first round, some players were able to get very, very close. Although the top scoring model uh, over here is not the closest, uh, and you also notice there's a lot less green dots than usual on this plot. That's because very, very few uh, players were able to get uh, close to the native. It, this was such a, a hard problem. But what we did is we used the top models from this first round and were able to trim that huge, crazy electron density cloud and give it to the folded players one more time. Uh, so this is what we posted for round two. Again, an extended chain, but with uh, that trimmed ba density based off of the folded uh, solutions from the first round. Much better than what we gave them uh, the first time in terms of that uh, crazy cloud. And so this was the results that we just uh, looked at for round one. And in round two, a lot more players uh, were able to get closer to the native 
um, thanks to that easier density uh, that they had uh, to deal with. And this was the top uh, scoring folded solution, which was very, very close uh, to the native. Just a few uh, small deviations uh, over here. Especially when you compare this to the best automated uh, model, uh, which you know, <laughs> is, is, is nowhere clear, close to, to what the players did. And even some of the side chains that the players got uh, were, were spot on and, and lined up perfectly uh, with, with the native. So the obvious next step is to give players an unsolved case. But that's actually proved to be quite difficult because, as I mentioned, solving protein structures is a very difficult and time-consuming process. So you can imagine crystallographers that are working on solving a protein for years are not going to be that comfortable suddenly giving that data to a bunch of gamers that are going to be posted uh, uh, all, all around the world. And so that's actually been really, really hard, um, the, the kind of... Uh, security, security issue and, and, and fear of, of having your data um, compromised um, has made it very difficult to actually find cases um, that are unsolved that the folded players could help with. Um, and very frustrating too. Uh, but as a laboratory exercise at the University of Michigan, uh, an undergrad class with 57 students tried to solve a crystal structure given only a high resolution electron density map uh, and a crystal crystallography program called COOT. It turns out that actually some of the um, students uh, did really well. And so the authors contacted us, and we then ran the same experiment uh, with folded players. And the top nine folded models, ranked by, uh, by folded score, uh, were all correctly placed uh, within uh, the density. The only one that uh, wasn't is obviously this uh, uh, crazy uh, one over here. So then the authors suggested another interesting experiment. They had a structure for a different protein that they had just solved, but hadn't released yet. And they wanted to see if other non-traditional methods could solve it. And if so, how those different methods would compare to the standard methods. So for this experiment, we had expert trained crystallographers. We had automated methods. In this case, Phoenix Autosolve uh, did it best. So that was the one that was uh, selected. 61 uh, undergraduate students at the University of Michigan in an introduction to protein structure and function class, the folded players, uh, and Rosetta's automated uh, method uh, specific for molecular replacement, uh, MR Rosetta. So here are some snapshots of, of players building their models uh, into density uh, for the protein, uh, which I have to say I'm always impressed by this <laughs> because I can't see how anything fits in any of those density maps and the players are really, really good at it. Um, so that's always very impressive to me. And here are the results. Comparing the best model from each of the five different groups. And for all these graphs, the lower the bar, uh, the better. And so you know, for many of them, you know, everybody did uh, pretty much the same. This one uh, was, was pretty close. Folded did a, a little bit worse there. Uh, MR Rosetta did uh, you know, better. But in this particular case, and in this particular case, the folded players really outperformed uh, all the other methods. Um, and, uh, and here, the, the, the crystallographers and the folded players uh, did, um, did a lot better. And this was very, very exciting. Um, and here you can see the, you know, the very slight but crucial differences between the top folded model, which is uh, the one shown in green, and the top model that was created by uh, a crystallographer. These are very, very uh, small uh, differences, but they can you know, just a little bit of, 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 of packing difference can make a big deal when it comes to clashes or, or to the rest of the um, topology of the protein. So how can our amazing folded players outperform experts and state-of-the-art methods? This, this goes back to you know, the fact that folded players have so many different tools uh, at their disposal. And more importantly, they have the ability uh, at which to use whichever one they decide uh, is, is best. Humans can change their mind. Uh, and try a different approach based on what it is that they currently see. That's a lot harder to get a computer to do. Um, and you know, when it comes to, to the experts, the trained crystallographers, you know, these folded tools don't just have to be uh, for citizen scientists. Being able to modify a protein in real time makes it a very useful protein manipulation tool for scientists as well. It's, it's not just for gamers. Um, 
perhaps expert crystallographers that were using Foldit could actually do, uh, do better. Uh, plus, they wouldn't have to compete with our Foldit players that have been playing for almost 10 years next month. Um, so scientists are actually able now to perform uh, all these tasks uh, in the Foldit interface, uh, where they can visualize uh, the effect of, of any uh, changes that they made um, instantaneously. And in fact, using Foldit undergrads that were participating in the International uh, Synthetic Biology Competition, uh, which is called iGEM, were able to generate an enzyme with potential as a therapeutic for celiac disease. Uh, so this was over five years ago, um, but it was actually recently announced that this year they would be starting uh, clinical trials, uh, which is very, very exciting. Uh, in 2014, UC Davis students used Foldit, um, and they won the iGEM competition uh, by creating a biosensor that detects rancid olive oil. I didn't know this, but apparently there's a lot of rancid olive oil uh, in grocery store shelves. No, this is true. <laughs> It was very surprising to me. Um, and so they, they created a, a detector um, using, using Foldit as well. Foldit is also a great tool uh, for education. Uh, people assign it as, as homework problems. It's, it's now in, uh, in textbooks uh, as well. You know, I found it very, very useful uh, for getting kids excited about science. And uh, at, you know, whether it's a local science museum uh, or at science fairs or, or, or local schools. Um, and I actually had a a Foldit player from uh, Australia, uh, sorry, from New Zealand, uh, comment on my shirt here, um, which was, uh, I, felt, I felt bad about that. I was just trying to find a shirt that would make kids happy. <laughs> um, uh, but in fact, I was, I was in uh, DC this past weekend uh, at the free uh, USA Science and Engineering Festival, uh, which is the largest science festival uh, in the country, and we, we presented uh, Foldit to the community. We had uh, a great time. And I went to the, uh, the NIH at a table, um, where they presented different games uh, in science. And uh, I actually found out about a new mobile game uh, that I'd never heard of uh, called Colony B. I was familiar with all these other games. Um, and that brings me to the question that I got asked the most at the science festival. Why can't I play Foldit on my cell phone, on my smartphone? Why is it not a mobile version? It goes back to how much computation is required for the protein folding problem. Uh, your phone battery would be dead in minutes. Um, so you know, one obvious solution is, well, why don't we just put it up on the cloud, and then you can control it that way. But somebody has to pay for the cloud, <laughs> so that's always tricky. So um, for folded remote control is kind of uh, similar to this, uh, where all the calculations are done on your home computer, uh, for example, and then you control everything uh, remotely. Um, but it would be a lot more fun if you play folded in your living room uh, with the whole family. which is what uh, you can do with the Foldit uh, Connect. And so, yeah, I, there are so many people uh, that I need to thank. Um, but honestly, most of all, um, I need to thank the players, uh, without which there would be no game. There would be no amazing results um, that we're so very proud of. Um, and I want to thank that one uh, math professor who, who taught that um, mathematics of the human genome course, uh, Lior Pachter. Uh, Awesome mathematician, he's now at Caltech. So I gotta thank him too. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Is it all? Ooh. Um, yeah, I, they, they do. It seems the main, the main skill that's required for, for Folded is patience, though. No, honestly, um, <clears throat> if you look at uh, your typical gamer, those aren't, those aren't the people that are playing Folded. You know, they'll, 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 they'll try it out. We have an, an, an attrition graph where we can see how long people have played the tutorials, and it goes down very, very fast. Um, after a couple levels, people go, well, this is way too hard. Um, but there, there's a definite advantage in terms of, of being able to, to recognize certain, certain aspects, you know, whether it's secondary structure or, or how um, certain residues you know, line up. Um, but the folded players have picked all this up intuitively. And, and even more amazingly, they've uh, started 
you know, reading papers and then sharing it with the, other, the rest of the community. And, you know, there's YouTube videos where they go over this very detailed and very complicated uh, protein uh, paper and they say, you know, well, you know, this is what they were doing with this. Maybe we should be doing that. And it's, it's called black belt folding is, is what the videos are. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. <clears throat> Right, so you know that that we're very fortunate with that aspect because that's a, a very difficult um, problem for anybody who's starting up a citizen science project or or any of these games. Um, we had the 1.3 million Rosette at Home users as kind of the first, hey, <laughs> check this out. And you know, the game was released supposed to be released on uh, May uh, 10th, I want to say, and uh, Slashdot announced it on May 9th. And the website crashed immediately <laughs> um, because we had so many, uh, you know, people who who, who knew about it. Um, so so that was very fortunate. And then you know we, we haven't we don't do any advertising. Uh, anytime there's you know a uh, uh, new paper that's published or or you know a report done on Foldit, we have this huge spike in players. Uh, our first Nature paper that that, that you mentioned uh, that was the one day where everything went wrong. Somebody tripped on the cord in the power room. The server went down, uh, and and then we were all out of the country. That particular, it was yeah, but luckily everybody thought it just went down because the paper came out, um, so it worked out well. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, we were we were very like very lucky about that. Piggybacking on something else, if you can, is a great way to. Yes. Yeah. Of course, yes. Do do do. Ha ha. <laughs> so uh, one of the co-creators of Foldit. Um, Adrian Troy uh, started an RNA folding game with uh, colleagues at Stanford who, who, were, um, who had worked on Rosetta uh, before, uh, and it's called uh, Eterna. And it's basically uh, not just RNA folding, uh, but RNA uh, design. And so they're actually um, designing these new, uh, new ways to fold RNA. And their Eterna story is, is really interesting because you know, they, they worked on it for, for quite a while, and the players were you know, very, very motivated, motivated and, and and it wasn't, it wasn't getting anywhere. They, they kept getting the results back, and they just, they just weren't good. And you know, the, the, the designers of the game were like, you know, what do we do? What do we tell players when it's just not working? And the players said, give us more feedback. Tell us what we're doing wrong. And, and it was this amazing loop where as time went out, up, as time went by, their level just improved and eventually just surpassed the automated methods of RNA folding. Um, and it's been another amazing success story. And, and the cool thing about Eterna is they will actually uh, synthesize uh, your structure really, really quick. You know, we, we can't do that because we go, oh yeah, we'll, we'll solve your crystal structure, no problem. Um, but, but they're able to do that. And so what happens is <clears throat> Eterna players create a bunch of, of different uh, predictions and then they all vote as players which ones they want to then go to the lab and synthesize. And so it's just really, Really cool, uh, cool process. As science should be. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, um, let's thank Professor Khatib again. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>